at the Vatican, 2012 was a year to remember. We'll take you through the highlights this week, starting with the major events on Pope Benedict XVI's schedule. We hear from the top about the year of faith still underway. We also take a look back at October Synod of Bishops for the new evangelization. And we remember the two new American saints and three newest American cardinals created this year. Archbishop William Laurie of Baltimore tells us about his busy year that brought him to Rome numerous times. The rector of the North American College looks back on the highlights of the year for him and his seminarians. All this on the last episode of Vaticano in 2012. At 85 years old, the Pope is beginning to show signs that he is slowing down. He has started to carry a cane with him on trips and uses a mobile platform to enter St. Peter's Basilica. But he still has a schedule that allows him to see and be seen by millions of people every year. In addition to his weekly audience on Wednesdays and his Sunday Angelus appointments, he went to Mexico, Cuba and Lebanon this year. The Easter season was a busy one, but this year October was by far his busiest month. In that single month, he took part in the three-week synod of bishops, canonized seven new saints, inaugurated the Year of Faith, and marked celebrations for the 50th year since the Second Vatican Council. He also created a total of 28 new cardinals in two consistories, one in February and the second in November. Today, the total number of voting age cardinals for a possible conclave is at its maximum, 120 individuals under 80 years of age. He did also have some time to rest, though. While he spends most of his time in Rome, he goes to Castel Gandolfo in the summertime to write, pray, and recuperate from his demanding schedule as the shepherd of the world's more than one billion Catholics. The year of faith began on October 11th. It's a year to mark 50 years since the Second Vatican Council but more so it's time of grace to rediscover Christ. During this opening Mass in St. Peter's Square, the Pope said that amidst the void of the spiritual desert that is advancing today, people can always discover the joy of believing. In the desert, we rediscover the value of what is essential for living. Thus, in today's world, there are innumerable signs, often expressed implicitly or negatively, of the thirst for God, for the ultimate meaning of life. And in the desert, people of faith are needed, who with their own lives, point out the way to the promised land and keep hope alive. Living faith opens the heart to the grace of God, which frees us from pessimism. Today, more than ever, evangelizing means witnessing to the new life, transformed by God, and thus showing the path. The last time the Church observed a year of faith was in the post-council church in 1967. Now, just as then, the Church is seeking a type of reawakening. The year of faith uh, should be for all the Church and all the believers. It should be a moment of prayer, a moment of spirituality, and also a moment in which we can, uh, we can take in serious consideration the teaching of the Vatican II. This priest from New Jersey is working with Archbishop Isakella at the Pontifical Council for the New Evangelization. He started up a Sunday Mass for English pilgrims at the Church of Santo Spirito in Sassia, and he's passionate about his work. That's celebrating in mystery the passion of your son. I have to say, working for Archbishop Fisichella and, and being on the council is really exciting because Right now, the Pontifical Council, being new, is really open to, to the ideas of dreaming the future of the church and new evangelization, um, being able to try new things and to move forward with new things. Um, so it's really exciting to be able to start on the council with the opening of the Year of Faith as well, because uh, so many of the initiatives for the Year of Faith are really coming under the leadership of Archbishop Fisichella and the Pontifical Council. Um, so I'm really just starting in this, but what I've seen and what has been so great is the openness, but also the excitement that the members of the Council have for the new evangelization and, and really for the salvation of souls. How can we help people 
uh, come to know Christ and, and, and taste that joy that can only come from the one who is the author of life, Jesus Christ. The Year of Faith is being observed until November 24, 2013. Initiatives will be led from Rome and on a local level in dioceses throughout the world and can be followed on the Vatican's website www.anusfide.va. Looking back at the series of catechesis Pope Benedict started on the Year of Faith, that of October 24th is spectacular as he speaks of his hope for each Catholic during this special year. Dear brothers and sisters, in our series of catechesis for the Year of Faith, we now consider the nature of faith. More than simple knowledge about God, faith is a living encounter with him through faith we came to know and love God, who reveals himself in the life, death, and the resurrection of Christ, and in so doing reveals the deepest meaning and truth of our human existence. Faith offers us sure hope and direction amid the spiritual confusion of our times. Before all else, faith is a divine gift which enables us to open our hearts and minds to God's word, and through baptism to share in his divine life within the community of the church. Yet faith is also a profoundly human act, engaging our intelligence and freedom. When we welcome God's invitation and gift our lives and the world around us are transformed. May this year of faith help us to live our faith fully and to invite others to hear and welcome God's word, opening their hearts to the eternal life with faith promises. The Holy Father will continue to reaffirm the importance of faith during the general audiences throughout the Year of Faith. More than 450 people between bishops and experts on evangelization came together at the Vatican in October to discuss the Catholic Church's approach to re-evangelizing traditionally Christian areas of the world. For three weeks, they aim to answer the question of how to engage people today amid the eclipse of God in the Western world. I think it is important for, for, for all of us to um, uh, have a new enthusiasm in the way that we know and uh, practice our faith. We know and we are learning during these days the uh, Catholic faith has the answers for all the challenges of our society. There's no magic formula. Uh, one, uh, the, the, the bases are the same so that um, we have to preach Christ, but what does that mean? It has to be spelled out. It's been most reassuring and not a bit surprising that uh, the sin is completely Christocentric. But that means Christ is the Son of God as well as the Son of, uh, uh, of Mary. It uh, means Christ as uh, Redeemer, Christ as moral teacher. His moral teachings are not uh, like a final exam where you only need to do six out of ten questions. Um, this, these are the central challenges and they'll always be and it's, uh, we have to come at these with new enthusiasm and new ways. For example, the whole world of the internet that's opening up, we've got to be in there and using it. I'd say one of the things that's coming out here in the Synod is that no matter what country bishops are from and no matter what continent, they all find it very relevant because whether it's in the ancient churches of Europe or the young churches of Africa, everybody's facing the problem of just a aggressive secularism that's affecting people all over the world. Like there's really an international pagan culture that's affecting everybody and lots and lots of baptized Catholics are no longer living in real discipleship with Jesus. And so everybody sees it really relevant right now to uh, focus our attention on re-evangelizing uh, baptized Catholics who aren't living as disciples of Christ. All of the texts of the short discourses made at the Synod are available at www.vatican.va. The major document, called an apostolic exhortation and signed by the Pope himself, is expected to be published within one year. For the president of the U.S. Bishops' Conference, it's the vocation of every individual Catholic to take part. We're in this together. And instead of <coughs> fractioning the church into the different segments, bishops, clergy, uh, you know, religious women, religious men, movements, parishes, institutions, rather than fractioning perhaps what best we can do, is emphasize, we, we say the universal call to holiness from the Second Vatican Council, to emphasize the universal call to the new evangelization. 
that it is a charge from which no one can escape if one takes discipleship and Catholic identity seriously. It is a charge implicit in our baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, and sacrament of penance to go. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. For the head of the Fellowship of Catholic University Students who brought a hundred of his on-campus missionaries with him to Rome, the legacy of the Synod is just beginning to be understood. I believe that we're going to look back five years, 15 years, 35 years from now at the Synod of Bishops on the New Evangelization and see a watershed moment when the Church rediscovered who she was. We're told in the official documents that the Church's deepest identity is that of evangelization. And so to rediscover our deepest identity will awaken the church, the members of the church, in a way that nothing else will. And we will see a healthy, vibrant church, maybe experiencing persecution in places, but vibrant and growing. And as we do that, we'll recognize as we look that this synod, when the Holy Father gathered leaders from around the church to pray together, to, to study together and discuss together, and then to go back to the people that they have in their lives and have influence with and to share that vision, we're going to see this as the spark that's going to ignite a fire that is going to travel throughout the earth and really reach souls and it will change their eternal destiny. So it, I don't think it can be overstated how important the Synod was, but even more so how important the fruit that's going to come from the Synod will be. And the focus missionaries are just as excited as their leader to get their hands on the concluding document from the Pope that will set the course for evangelizing work in the 21st century. Well, oftentimes, um, when you look at scripture or you look at uh, other examples of when people proclaim the gospel, it's very particular to the culture and the circumstances of the apostle who's speaking. Uh, I think what would be helpful would be to find one that's universal, that is a skeleton, if you will, that every missionary, regardless of the campus or the season or the, the people that they work with, they can put flesh on that skeleton. On October the 21st, Pope Benedict XVI created seven new saints. Before Mass in a packed St. Peter's Square, he canonized them. That is, he recognized them as exemplary figures of holiness. The Son of Man came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. These words were the blueprint for living of the seven blessed men and women that the Church solemnly enrolls this morning in the glorious ranks of the saints. With heroic courage, they spent their lives in total consecration to the Lord and in the generous service of their brethren. They are the sons and daughters of the Church who chose a life of service following the Lord. Holiness always rises up in the Church from the wellspring of the mystery of redemption. Among the new saints were two American women. There was German-born Saint Marian Cope, a religious who, along with Saint Damien of Molokai, cared for lepers in Hawaii. There is also the first Native American Indian to be canonized, St. Kateri Tekakwitha, half Mohawk, half Algonquin Indian. She lived between present-day New York State and Montreal, Canada in the 1600s. Uh, she was young, 24 years old when she died, so her Christian life was led rather intensely as a young adult. And so in some ways I think she would be a, a, a patron for young adults in the church. Um, she committed herself to a, a life of chastity which is a great struggle for so many people in our culture. So I think she's a great example of that for our day. And in a unique way, she's an example to Indian people of the possibility of being wholly Indian, because she was wholly Indian, and wholly Christian at the same time. There's no uh, contradiction between one and the other. The saints are the embodiment of what Pope John Paul II referred to as enculturation, which is the penetration uh, of the gospel into a culture, and it transforms culture. Um, the gospel penetrated her life and transformed her into a saint. And uh, that kind of process is an ongoing process for all of us. The other five saints represented Europe and Asia. Many mass attendees were there for St. Pedro Calunso, the young Filipino catechist and martyr. Each of them thus enters into the Catholic catalog of saints. May the holiness and witness of the saints 
inspire us to draw closer to the Son of God, who for such great love came to serve and offer his life for our salvation. God bless you all. called a consistory takes place in St. Peter's Basilica every so often for the creation of new cardinals. 2012 saw two of them, one in February and another in November. A total of three of the men to receive red barrettes are from the United States. New York-born Cardinal Edwin F. O'Brien was a military chaplain during the Vietnam War. He later served as the head of the Archdiocese for Military Services and more recently as the Archbishop of Baltimore. With his 2011 appointment as the Grand Master of the Rome-based Knights of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem came the step up to Cardinal. Well, I hope I've been preparing all my life for the day and certainly since I've been named a Cardinal, I've been uh, spending a little extra time in reflection, uh, in prayer, uh, trying to open my heart, my soul to whatever graces the Lord wants to provide for me a day like this and in the days that follow. Cardinal Timothy Dolan was originally ordained to the Archdiocese of St. Louis. He was made Archbishop of Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 2002, and after six years he was appointed to lead the Archdiocese of New York. In 2010 he was voted in by his brother bishops as the President of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. This was an occasion of great joy and, and uh, honor for me and my family and, and so many friends. But see, the gospel and his words were very somber because they reminded us, and the gospel is on purpose. Uh, they, they, they recall the words of Jesus saying, we're not in it for the prestige, we're not in it for the honor, we're not in it for the glory, we're in it to serve. That's what Jesus said. And then, of course, he, he spoke about, uh, reminded us of, of the color red being our willingness to even shed our blood, our blood in defense of the faith and the church and of human dignity. So that's kind of sombering, but it puts it all in perspective. You know what else put it into perspective? When we, um, when at the end we got to approve and give the affirmation for the two new saints, two of whom are New Yorkers. So I thought, you know, as, mu as, as grateful as I am for being a cardinal, I really want to be a saint. <laughs> and I, I mean that, and I got a long way to go, believe me. But it's all about, it's all about holiness, it's all about friendship with Jesus. It's all about being a saint. That's what I want to be. Meanwhile, Cardinal James Harvey from the Archdiocese of Milwaukee was the lone American made cardinal in November. For nearly 15 years, he served alongside the popes as the head of the pontifical household, that is, a sort of director of his daily schedule. He is now the archpriest of the Roman Basilica of St. Paul's Outside of the Walls. With the addition of these three, there are now 20 U.S. cardinals, of which 11 are of voting age in the case of a conclave for a new pope. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. Well, it's been quite the year. Um, if you go back a little prior to the beginning of 2012, I had the privilege of uh, coming for a limit of visits. Uh, I was with the New England bishops at the time because I was Bishop of, of Bridgeport. Um, so that certainly was a beautiful moment of communion with the Holy Father. A moment when, because we were a small group and could have a free-flowing dialogue with him, I think we all felt especially close to the Holy Father and uh, felt his pastoral warmth, but also his great dedication to the Word of God and to the new evangelization. So um, that certainly prepared the way uh, for an exceptional year. Um, the year has been marked by a, a lot of involvement in the struggle to preserve and defend religious liberty. Uh, the Health and Human Services mandate, um, the rules for it came out in January, followed by an accommodation. That has really caused the work of the Bishops' Conference with regard to religious liberty 
uh, to take on a, a, a renewed and special urgency. But of course, it led up to the fortnight of freedom, uh, as well as to the, um, uh, as well as to the uh, uh, pilgrimage for life and liberty, uh, and so many efforts about religious liberty that have really marked this entire uh, year. For me, it's been, meant giving a lot of talks. I've never exactly gone on the road with something, but I certainly have gone on the road with religious liberty talks uh, in various parts of the country. Um, and so it's been an interesting year from that point of view. In March, I learned that I was to become the 16th Archbishop of Baltimore. I saw a link immediately with religious liberty because uh, the Archdiocese of Baltimore was established in 1789. The first uh, Archbishop of Baltimore, John Carroll, was a cousin to Charles Carroll, the only Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence. Really, Baltimore is at the heart of this American experiment of limited government and religious freedom. Um, and, 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 and beginning my service in Baltimore has been a wonderful um, a time of adventure, coming to know a, a new presbyterate, uh, a very large Catholic charities operation, one of the largest in the country, visiting new and also historic parishes, a um, bit of a homecoming because before I went to Connecticut, I spent many years in the Archdiocese of Washington and therefore lived in Maryland. So that's been an interesting moment. Was faced right away with a marriage uh, ballot question, same-sex marriage in Maryland. That was a challenge to get right out of the gate and start working on that. We were still collecting signatures to get on the ballot at the time. We lost by three points in a deeply blue state, outspent, uh, perhaps five to one. Um, but nonetheless, 48% uh, of Marylanders uh, agreed that marriage should be between a man and a woman, one man and one woman. So all in all, a very, very interesting year. I have to tell everybody how happy I am uh, to be the Archbishop of Baltimore. I miss my friends and my co-workers back in Bridgeport, uh, but I've been so warmly received in Baltimore that uh, for all the challenges this year has, has, has brought, it's brought me a lot of joy. The year was also an extraordinary one for the boys at Rome's North American College. Vaticano was there for the major moments. Certainly, 2012 is a historic year here at the college uh, for us. Uh, we have 48 men ordained priests uh, this year, 44 ordained to the diaconate this year. We had uh, two of our former rectors became cardinals in the consistory in February. Uh, cardinal Harvey, an alumnus of the college, uh, became a cardinal in the more recent uh, consistory. The Clericus Cup was a great uh, experience for us, and it, it has been for, for a few years. Each year we got a little better. You know, we're not favored in soccer often. You know, the Europeans and South Americans uh, have been playing soccer since they uh, are born, you know, and so it's kind of, it's grown up more recently in the United States, and, and our men have gotten better every year, and they work hard. Uh, so that's why they've gotten better. And our team, we made it to fourth place, third place, second place, and then finally last year, uh, we won the championship. They bought home the, the, the trophy, the cup. And uh, so it was great celebration. And it's great because it's really an opportunity for the men to work together and pray together in a different way than normal. Um, and it's a, it became a great community effort and activity and focus. And uh, it really helped in, uh, you look at forming men for the priesthood in all different ways. And one way is to have strong fraternity uh, amongst them as they go into the priesthood to have that support uh, of brothers and to learn to pray together and to work together and to set goals and to accomplish them. And uh, so it was really a great, uh, great activity for the whole house. Uh, we had 61 new men come to the college this year to begin their training for priesthood here in, uh, in Rome in the, right near St. Peter's in the shadow of the dome, as we say. 
uh, near the Vicar of Christ. So 61 new men, uh, all that in front of them, that great experience that they'll have. Uh, we have 61 priests at the Casa Santa Maria engaged in our graduate studies. Um, we have 254 men here in this house altogether. So our house is completely full. So the second year in a row that we've had this blessing uh, of having a full house. I think there's a great interest in, uh, in following uh, things in Rome too uh, with the Holy Father, uh, certainly John Paul II uh, it increased all the time under him too, uh, and certainly when his funeral and the election of Pope Benedict uh, and the care and the dedication that I think um, the bishops see, uh, the Holy Father, of course, given to priests and seminarians, and that's given at the college too. Uh, we, have a, we have a top rate faculty. We're so blessed uh, with our faculty here at the college, uh, 20 priests. Uh, it's our largest priest faculty ever also in our history. Um, just very good men, uh, great witnesses to the men uh, and great instructors too. The North American College is an oasis for American seminarians in Rome, and it's just about to get better. The college will soon be breaking ground for an $8.5 million building project that will increase the study space and provide better formation opportunities for the future priests of America.